Hello, friends. Welcome to our 42nd episode. So there are many among us who struggle with imposter syndrome. And that's the topic we're going to be diving into today, talking about imposter syndrome and how it shows up in our work, our school, some personal lives. And we have a guest with us today. We have our friend Liz. Um, so, Ming, do you want to introduce Liz for us? I would be honored to introduce Liz. Although, I feel like technically Sally should introduce her because she was the one who introduced or mentioned Liz to me. So, Liz and I, uh, we met the spring of my freshman year because we both applied to be orientation advisors at school and we were in a class together and then we spent the whole summer together. And I think we got pretty decently close over that summer, as a lot of people did in that program. And then you know, time passed, and then somehow we're still really close now, and we have, like, weekly chats, so Liz is a very good friend of ours. Sally, of course, knows her from church, Um, so welcome, Liz. Do you want to give your little introduction, like, what year you graduated and what you do now? I would love to. Um, Okay, so I'm Liz. I graduated in the class of 2019, so one year before um, these three ladies here. I graduated with a double degree in marketing and information systems. Those are separate things, not related. (laughs) Some people think I did marketing information systems as like one thing. No, different. Mm -hmm. We don't need to get into that because it's not what I do. (laughs) Um, So what I do is I am a business financial management analyst intern for the Navy. And yes, it is a mouthful. Um, And although I said that I'm an intern, I am a full-time salaried employee. It's just because I'm part of an entry-level career development program that I am called an intern for three years. Um, And we'll save that for later, but I think that being, having intern as part of my title leads a little bit to imposter syndrome for me, Mm. but I'll save it Mm -hmm. for later. (laughs) A nice teaser. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Okay, going into our weekly recap, um, I guess I'll start off. So for this week, um, Ming and I kind of, I guess, swapped (laughs) hobbies, swapped interests. So my weekly recap is that I recently started and finished this book um, called Circe, which Ming recommended, I think, one or two months ago. Yes. As part of the (laughs) Curl Up Club (laughs) book club. Um. And I really like this book, and it was actually, like, the reason why I got through it so fast. So I finished it in three days, which is, like, impressive, unheard of for me. (laughs) Yeah. So the reason why I got through it so fast is because it was a really, I mean, it was a really good book, and, like, I was itching to see how her (laughs) story ended up, but also it was very relatable for me because, um, so Cersei is, like, a lower goddess. Um, She's, like, a nymph, if that means anything. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't have much power, so it makes her, like, it leads into a lot of, like, imposter syndrome that she also deals with. (laughs) Spoiler for this episode. Um, And it was really interesting to also, like, um, read about her story as, like, an immortal and, like, seeing all these people's lives pass Mm -hmm. through hers as she's, like, stayed the same. And, yeah, kind of helped me reflect on my own life and be, like, Ooh. like not that I'm an immortal or anything but <laughs> like I don't know I guess like kind of motivated me to motivated me to want to um grow like improve myself even though sometimes I feel like I'm stuck in the same mm. like boat sometimes I don't know mm. relatable just a little <laughs> thoughts from my book a, ner- a nugget <laughs> a nugget of wisdom um yeah do you want to move yeah, on I guess, to Ming? Yeah, I guess I can go since um, you alluded that we have swapped <laughs> interests. And so, yeah, definitely this week I've gotten into another K-drama, which Sally recommended. And it seems like Sally's always watching some K-drama. So it's only appropriate that we swap this week. Um, so I started the internet famous, I guess now, like it's pretty popular um, startup and it's really good. Uh I feel like I'm the same way with um, K-dramas as Sally's with reading, but like once I start it, I kind of want to uh, like quickly watch it, but I'm trying to slow myself down because it's a ongoing series right now, and so I don't want to catch up too fast. I like being able to like 
binge. So I've been watching that. And besides that, I guess I'll talk about this later in the episode, but I had a pretty intense work week last week. Um, Just I had a big, big project to work on. And again, it brought out those imposter syndrome feelings. So we'll definitely talk about that. Um, But besides that, it's just been kind of K-dramas and Chinese classes and, you know, just life as normal. Um, So Linda, did you have any imposter syndrome feelings this week? Um, maybe imposter syndrome is that I'm not an adult ready to live by myself yet. Mm. But so I was supposed to sign my lease, I think today, but my roommate or the person who was supposed to be my roommate, let me know that their place has bed bugs. And so we can't move in to a new place together because apparently it takes like two weeks to do the um, treatment and then another eight weeks to make sure oh. like they're gone so yes. like we can't hang on to the apartment for that long so we might have to j- just let it go and there was like another option where they can move in without a lot of their possessions but it is like an unfurnished apartment so it's going to take a lot of work to actually move in I don't know it's like too much uncertainty for me and I might not I am that pressed to move but just like when the opportunity presented itself but it was fun to see the apartment with Ming and like Mm -hmm. I was asking the landlord questions and having the conversation I looked up an article it was like (laughs) questions to ask when you're like looking for an apartment or something Mm -hmm. so I like wrote them down like a piece of paper it was like a Hello Kitty notepad I don't know if Ming you saw it but (laughs) I was like hiding it it in my notebook and like like peeking at it to ask him the questions So that was kind of fun, and I guess it's like the first apartment you see, it's better not to just like snatch it up, even though it was a really nice place. So maybe something for later. Um, Mm. It happens really fast, so now I'm just like at equilibrium right now. (laughs) But that was the main thing in my week. Liz, how was your week? It's been busy, but good. Um, So I also had a big week at work. Uh, My team was responsible for a a meeting, basically, and I guess, yeah, the details are not important, but (laughs) it was just like a lot of running around and and having to get to work earlier than usual, which I barely did. Um, (laughs) I took a lift twice this week, and I still like just made it. Like I was I was walking as fast as my desperate little legs could walk (laughs) and I like still like I rushed in there with like five minutes to spare grabbed my computer went down to the conference room and I was like hey sorry (laughs) Um, and I have to get to work early again tomorrow so really hoping that I can stick to my schedule and actually leave on time Um, Mm -hmm. but it was busy and I think because I haven't been this busy in a while um, I felt really tired Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, and I guess I should add that the reason I haven't felt busy in a while is because I'm on rotation as part of my program. So around, was it October or November? No, this is November. So in October, (laughs) I started a new rotation, which is essentially me starting a new job, even though I'm still in the same position, same managers, um, but I'm just at a different office temporarily. Mm-hmm. Liz, I know going to work early is hard, but I wish I had a commute to experience right now. Oh, um, not like the rush. Interesting. <laughs> Liz's face is like, no, girl. <laughs> no, you don't. The commute is okay. Um, mine is about 40 to 50 minutes, which, oh, wow. Eh, uh, it could okay. be shorter. I think I don't mind commuting when I don't have to be there by a certain time. Mm. Then I feel a little more relaxed, like, oh, my schedule slipped 10 minutes, it's going to be okay. But this week, if I slip 10 minutes, it's not going to be okay. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But the metro is actually not too crowded. I either take the metro or the bus, and usually I I have a lot of space. Mm -hmm. Nice. Good. We're going to start off with the meat of this episode. Um, And I have to say that I was really excited to have Liz on for this episode, Um, One, because I think she just has a good perspective 
Um, and what adds to that, I guess, is the fact that she did graduate a year above us. So, Liz, you've had like a full, what, year, year and a half to be working, to be post-grad. And so I think besides Sebastian, you're like one of our only guests who's actually like been fully in the, the workforce, been out of college environment for a while. So I'm excited to hear your perspective. And I think that we, like we said earlier, we were already alluding to the fact that we all experience imposter syndrome, but especially so as new um, post-grads. So maybe you would actually have tips for us, or maybe you're still like feeling that day to day, but yeah, we can get into that. Um, first, I wanted to define imposter syndrome because I think it's becoming more popular to talk about, but I certainly didn't hear about it until maybe end among of high us. school, college. Oh. <laughs> no, not among us. <laughs> But imposter syndrome, not imposter, is defined as a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their skills, talents, or accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. And so I think that last part kind of separates it from regular like insecurities, but the fact that you feel like you're an actual fraud and that like any day someone could figure it out, or at least that's what I really feel. So I guess we can get started by just kind of comparing our experiences. Maybe did we experience imposter syndrome in college? And then I know we have out of college, so maybe we can like dive into that more. Yeah. Let's start with our experiences in college first, I guess. So Liz, you want to go first as our most uh, furthest from college. (laughs) What I keep hearing when you guys say that is that I'm among your oldest friends. I mean, that's a good thing. I mean, yeah. (laughs) We're all our role model wise oh. sorry just took a sip of water but yeah so have I did I feel imposter syndrome in college oh yes but no I think one of the defining characteristics or story arcs of my college career was that I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do um and honestly that even leads all the way up to me being where I am now I didn't know what I wanted to do I had some vague ideas and I'm grateful for the job I have now but I I took the first job that I got um in college I started as a business major and spoiler spoiler (laughs) alert (laughs) I did graduate with two business degrees, um, but I tried education. I thought about communication. um, And so, yes, in the business school, I definitely felt imposter syndrome because all four years, I just remember thinking so often that I don't care about the shareholder profit, Mm -hmm. which is a very naive thing to say because everybody needs money to do something. Um, But a lot of my professors would be drilling that home and no shade to them because this is business. That is a core tenet of business. You want to maximize shareholder profit. Um, But I found myself just not caring about it, not interested in investing, also not good at finance or accounting (laughs) or beast. (laughs) Um, So I definitely felt out of place as just someone who, I wasn't interested in doing business, but I couldn't find something else that I liked more that would let me graduate on time. Mm. And so I just stayed there because eventually I accepted every industry has business. So I don't have to go to Wall Street. I don't have to do investing or yeah, what is it? Investment baking. (laughs) Um, So yeah. Yeah. but I definitely used to feel like that. I would always have this idea like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not a good business student. I would say that to myself a lot. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think that about covers it for imposter syndrome during college. I didn't really, I did internships during college and I think I was almost always working. Um, but those were jobs I felt pretty comfortable in. And I think student jobs often give you that sense of comfort like they they know who you are they're not expecting anything more Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. makes sense yeah okay I guess I'll go next (laughs) so um I guess my experience of imposter syndrome in college has to do with um has a lot to do with our transition from high school to college Mm -hmm. so in high school I thought that you know I was like top 
ten percent class, maybe science top five percent. Yeah, mm-hmm. type science and tech. We were in the Mick and I were sitting in the front row at graduation. You know, I forgot about wow. that. Yeah, and How then we when we got to college, I realized like I'm not in the temp- top ten percent. Like there was so many people smarter than me um, in my mm-hmm. classes. Like everyone was pre med in my major. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone was like acing the classes while I was struggling. So that really like was a wake up call to me because in high school, I guess. Um, I didn't really learn how to study because I didn't have to study that hard in high school. But then going to college, I had like a major like shock where I like actually had to work hard for classes and had to like teach myself how to self-study a lot of things. And uh, it took a lot of adjustment. And I, honestly, I still like I'm not good at studying even mm-hmm. after <laughs> four years of college. But I think in my major, um, one of the classes that really like like I had a lot of imposter syndrome in was one of my lab, one of the first lab classes or it was sophomore year, second semester. And we had this lab class where we had to write lab reports every week on the experiment that we did during the week. And like, there was no guidance. I think it's a like typical thing for lab classes, but you don't really have guidance on the lab material. You kind of just have to learn it yourself and then write the report yourself. And then at the end, you just get the feedback on how well you taught yourself. So I don't know why, but I was not, I guess my like foundation in chemistry was not very good in high school. And then going to college, like I didn't know much about how to do basic thing, like basic calculations that everyone else seemed to know. So I was mm-hmm. always asking the smart kid in my lab class, like, how do you do this? Can you help me out? And like, that kind of hurt my pride in a like in a little bit because I used to be that smart kid that people asked me for help. Mm-hmm. So like, yeah. yeah, it was just like a very like sharp transition for me from high school to college, and then even now from college to the real world, an actual lab. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember. Maybe I wasn't paying attention that much, but I don't remember um, you talking about this, but. It makes sense because I think the transition is hard for a lot of yeah. people, especially when you do come from a like a higher place in your high school, I guess. Um, but I was wondering, since you were in a scholars program that was like life sciences, do you think that contributed to your, you were in a life sciences scholars program, you were in a like bio, were you in biochem? You were in biochem major, like everyone's pre-med. Do you mm-hmm. think if you were in a different program or something, you know? that wasn't directly related to like health or life sciences. Yeah, I think so. I mean, by nature of my major and like the programs I was in, everyone was like probably top percent of like in their class or whatever. And everyone was had high standards for themselves because they were pre-med. So in that sense, I guess I couldn't compete with their <laughs> motivation to like study because I mean, I was pre-med at first, but then when I realized, like, I could not keep up like this, I didn't have, like, such strong desire to go mm. the pre-med route, and, like, I don't know, I just, I couldn't keep up with them, so I realized, like, I think grad school is a little bit more lenient with grades, <laughs> so I decided to go the grad school route, but even now, like, even though I chose that I wanted to do grad school after college, I still don't really know, like, what I want to do, so... I mean, that's also, like, part of the, my imposter syndrome. Like, I study all these things in my classes, but, like, in terms of actual, um, like, a specific uh, research focus or whatever, I, I have no idea what mm-hmm. I really want to do. Mm-hmm. Linda? I like that doesn't really go away. Yeah. The feeling of, like, there's just so many, not even just within, like, research and science, just in the world there are so many interesting things Mm -hmm. that anyone could do and I'm just like oh that sounds really interesting and then like the next week I'm like I think I want to do this instead Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah I agree with you Mm -hmm. and like the fact that we're still like we're not even on the topic of like post-grad imposter syndrome but we still kind of keep alluding to it like if you're feeling it in college like it doesn't go away it only gets Um, bigger and bigger (laughs) Mm. but not to worry on listeners <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we're scaring them but um yeah Linda um I mean 
it's kind of like what Sally said before, like you're a big fish in a little pond and then the more, mm -hmm. like the older you get or like the more you want, move on to other things, you're like a little fish in a big pond. Like mm -hmm. Sally the was in like a bigger huge bigger. biochem <laughs> pond. Yeah, so it just keeps getting bigger. You have to like yeah. keep growing with it or I don't know. Or just like not care at all, I guess. <laughs> I think that's what I was doing for imposter syndrome. Like I didn't want to deal with it. So I was like distancing and like not trying to like not trying hard since I was studying. I was like, oh, um, I'm not going to get like a good grade anyway. So what's the point mm -hmm. in trying really hard? And I'll be like, oh, I'll just be an artist. And then I'm like, oh, but I need like stability. So I would like oscillate between two things I really wanted to invest in and end up like kind of waffling mm. back and forth. Um, there's also like, I think the one thing that was like distinctly imposter syndrome was being an RA. Cause I think for commons, everyone's like, you don't like really do anything cause the kids are grown. It's like the retirement home for <laughs> RAs. And I see Ming over here, like breaking up fights or like <laughs> dealing with drunk people in the hallway. And I'm like, mm. I really do nothing. And when something actually happens, I'm like, I have no idea what to do. Like, I am not an adequate RA, I guess. And like, I know that it's like, this job is kind of like whatever, but also if I had the opportunity to help someone, I would not know like what to do in this situation. So I was like, mm -hmm. I'm like totally an imposter within an RA thing. Like, it's not even like a syndrome at that point. That's so interesting, Linda, because... Okay, I guess I related to a lot of that. Um, the first part where you were talking about how you kind of just oscillated between like giving up on academics or like not putting um, so much focus on it to like to being an artist. I didn't do that exactly, but I don't think I experienced imposter syndrome in academics in college because I quickly learned like first semester that <laughs> I was no longer a big fish anymore. Like, um, yeah. I was schooled, okay? <laughs> and so, like, from the beginning, I think in academics, in college, I just knew that, I don't know if this is bad, but I was like, I'm not going to try to be the top of my class. I don't, I like what I'm learning, but I'm not trying to, like, like study and get, like, that the top, top level. So I was content with just, you know, like, doing decently good in class and learning, mm -hmm. but, like, not trying to stretch myself thin. So I, I didn't, I never felt, like, imposter syndrome over that because I was, like, you know, I don't really care, but yeah. it was more towards, like, the extracurriculars where I felt, like, a fraud in some circumstances. Like, I've definitely talked about this before, but going to CSA, total, like, identity, oh. like, I to those, yeah. yeah, when I went to FCA. Yeah, like, totally feeling like your identity, you're questioning your identity, and it's the first time I had exposure to, like, such a big group of Chinese Americans so I just felt completely like like a fraud and I didn't go back after like one meeting or something like that um and then in terms of the RA like Linda the fact that you felt like a fraud being a an RA in commons I felt like a fraud being an RA in Denton because I was Why? comparing myself to all the other RAs who were so like you know um extroverted and super like friendly and I was constantly telling my other RA like Christine that like I don't know how they picked me. I don't know how I got hired. Like, I definitely shouldn't have been mm. hired. I'm a horrible RA. And I just felt like I, like, it was bad of me for not having those personality types or, like, being honest that I was doing it mostly for a job. Like, I don't know. I just felt really bad. So I didn't realize that we, like, you know, same job, but, like, uh, I don't know, different feelings about it. Yeah, because I was comparing myself to Ming. I was like, what if I'm taking the place of someone who, like, <laughs> deserve to be here more or something uh, yeah all that comparison before we move on too much now that ming brought up the idea of imposter syndrome and extracurriculars that does remind <laughs> me of more i'm just so used to i've always thought about it in like a work context mm. um but ming mentioned like cultural associations i felt that when i first started going to filipino cultural association that's like a long story. My family has roots there, but ethnically we're Chinese. So I was kind of just like, am I supposed to be here? It's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. what really came to mind was volleyball, uh, which if you know me, you know that I love to play, but I haven't had any formal training. My high school didn't have a team. I always just played recreationally. So mm -hmm. I was always comparing myself to people who have literally been like, playing competitively for years 
um and just like I don't know I was just like so down on myself and I remember sophomore year I think either sophomore no it was junior year I decided to try out for club just to like just to try so I would have the structure to to get better um and I I was so anxious about making that decision. Um, I was afraid that like all my friends who were better than me would be like, why is she, why is she wasting Mm. her time? Like she's not good enough for that, even though club has different levels, um, which I mean, in the end, I didn't like it because the environment felt a little Mm -hmm. to me. Um, (laughs) But I was so stressed about people I knew who I thought were better at playing than I, than I was. I was so afraid that they would, just find out that Mm. I didn't even want to tell my at the time boyfriend about it like I remember we went for a walk (laughs) I was so stressed about telling him that I cried because I I was like I don't want anyone to know Mm. um but yeah that was my last story about (laughs) imposter syndrome in college I was Mm -hmm. like I don't want them to even know I'm trying that way they can't compare me Mm-hmm. yeah mm, I guess yeah. the common theme about around like all of our stories in college is that we compare ourselves to people when like I guess just by nature like people are at different levels um no matter academics culturally volleyball like mm-hmm. everyone's just at a different level and I mean it's hard to say don't compare but the only way to get past it is not to compare yourself to yeah other people yeah, for sure. Or comparing to yourself in the past or mm-hmm. something. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's an interesting topic too. <laughs> uh, okay. Maybe since we've graduated, we could graduate our discussion and like talk more about, you know, now, currently, post-grad, how we're feeling. We all have jobs. Uh, we've all been working, like Liz has been working for a year or so, and we've been working for a few months. Mm-hmm. So, um. I think Liz has a, you have a unique perspective as, you know, not having any uh, relation to anyone in the military at all. But I thought it's interesting that you, like, I don't even know how I would have heard of a, of a job in the Navy if I didn't have a connection there, but somehow you are working there. And so maybe you can like start talking about what it feels like to work, you know, in the military, mostly male, I feel like I've heard you say, or, you know, there yeah. are more hierarchical. There are. There are yeah. many women in the military. I just don't work with many of them. <laughs> um, yeah, so just like Ming said, um, if you don't have connections to the military, it's kind of just like, how, how did you find out that this was even a job? And mm-hmm. I've had people ask me that because um, at least within like this area, so the, the DMV, government is big. There's a lot of jobs, a lot of people's parents grandparents, aunts and uncles. It's, I once told my coworker, we were talking about, and I said, yeah, it kind of seems like it's a family business. And he, he laughed at that. And he was like, but yeah, it, it kind of is. Um, so he, he had grown up um, near a base. His parents both worked on the base. And that's true for a lot of my coworkers. They were either exposed to it by their family members being civilians working for the military Um, or their family was in the military. Um, So for me to have neither of those connections is surprising to people that I meet sometimes. Um, But the way I found out about it was the Robert H. Smith School of Business (laughs) Career Fair. Um, And so this was senior year. I had cycled through many different aspirations at this point. Um, but I, I pretty much settled into business. I was like, it's too late to switch majors again. I got to graduate and get out of here. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, I didn't like consulting. And to be fair, I didn't really understand what consulting was at the time. But mm-hmm. the business school at Maryland pushes it really hard. Um, so mm-hmm. like all those big four companies, accounting, consulting, I I don't even know how to describe it. It's like they do both. They have accounting and consulting practices, but you've probably heard of them and I'm not going to name names because I don't, I don't know. I don't want to get like, I don't work for them. Yeah, you know what I mean. (laughs) Um, But I I just, for some reason, I I was really opposed to it. Um, So I didn't even apply to those companies. And growing up, I'd always thought it would be 
cool to work for the military or the government. Um, the very first job I ever wanted, probably like a lot of kids, was to be president. If you ask me now, absolutely not. <laughs> um, and I went through I went through a military phase in sixth grade where I cut out some either army or marines recruitment posters from my sixth grade science magazine. Really? I taped them up on my wall, which oh my gosh. I really want to know what my parents were thinking at the time. Cause I was I was also a really small kid. I was <laughs> underweight for so long. <laughs> um yeah, so I, I came back to that senior year after having tried different majors, um, looked at different internships, didn't find any success there. And so I said, you know, the government's a, a really solid place to start. And senior year, I think, was just rough for me in general. And so when I went to the career fair, I, I approached it with this mindset of like, I just want to get a job. Yeah. I'm not looking for anything like too prestigious. Um, I don't want to talk to a lot of people. I don't want to feel like I have to sell myself because I imagine it's similar at any career fair, but especially at the business school, you can feel the the competitiveness in the year. You, you see your classmates and you're like, oh, hey, where, where are you? Where are you stopping? Oh, I just hit up this table. And then you're all waiting in line. And, and it's so interesting to watch people. They're waiting in line. They're just standing around. But when it's their turn, they like, they like flip a switch. They they turn themselves on. They they they're all networking and whatnot. And mm -hmm. I didn't have the energy for that senior year. And so, having an interest in the government, I looked around. And I said, "No one else is talking to them. I'm gonna talk to them." <laughs> um, so I went to all the government tables, and that's how I found where I work now. Um, I don't know. It didn't seem impressive at all. I, I barely understood what it was. But she said, you should apply. I was like, what do I have to lose? So I applied and I did end up getting that job. And I accepted it and now I'm here. Um, I don't, we, did that answer the original question? I feel like there's so much that I could say about the general feeling of imposter syndrome in this setting, but I don't wanna be the only one who talks. So we could also come back to me. I guess yeah, what we back. could all, um, sorry, what we could all kind of relate to is the idea of being maybe the youngest or maybe the newest potentially person on the team because we are, we're all pretty like early in on our start. So I know, Liz, that you were saying that um, your title as being intern might uh, contribute yes. to imposter syndrome. Uh, so maybe we could all like talk about that. Do you guys want to go first or should I just continue? Whoever. Um, okay, we can go first and then we come back around to you. <laughs> okay, so, let me catch my breath. Yeah. Okay, I guess I'll go first. Um, so my position is like a post back fellow. So it's kind of like a training position and it's a contract um, for two years. So there is like a finite end to this position. Um, so by nature, because it's a post back position, well, I guess the expectations for this position really depend on the mentor, but I feel like my expectations of myself and like my mentor's expectations of me and what my mentor realistic expectations for me are, like are all completely different. So <laughs> what I mean by this is um, because it's a two year position and it's like supposed to be training for graduate school, my um, idea of this job was like I would be able to um, work, I guess, eventually independently on this research and um, end up with some kind of published article either. Um, I mean, my boss, boss, like, I guess my the boss of my lab, which is not my mentor, he really expects me to have like a first author paper by the end of my position, whereas mm -hmm. my mentor is like, I don't know. I, I guess he thinks first author might be too high of a reach and he's just like, he's content with just like a middle, one or two middle author papers for me with, um, within this position. So that kind of sets the scene of like how much work that I should be able to do, I guess, within these two years. So I, in order to get a paper out or like in the process, you have to have, you know, obviously you have to have results by the end of your position and, 
Um, so I felt like by this time, it's been like almost half a year in this position, but I feel like like this is where the imposter syndrome comes in. I feel like I haven't really achieved much in, mm. at all in my research. Like I learned how to do things here and there, like just like skills that honestly took longer for me to learn than it should have, I feel like. But I feel like in terms of advancing research, I like feel like I haven't gone anywhere. And then when I compare myself to like the postback that's in my lab now and like the postback who position I took over, I don't know, I feel like I still am in such a early, like, fledgling stage <laughs> in this position. Like, I still can't do anything. Like, I still make so many mistakes. And, like, just this um, beginning of the week, my mentor was, like, yelling me because I made this – well, not yelling, but oh. um, berating oh. me because um, <laughs> I'm – Yeah. <laughs> because I made um, – like, I did something – um, last week and then I told him what I was doing last week like this week and then like in retro in retrospect I was telling him what already happened and then he was like you did this wrong like like he I guess he like let me to do some things that he assumed I would already know and then like some when it comes to some like when I have like a gap in knowledge I kind of just go with my first instinct on what to do um, and then like I don't really know like what are the right answers questions to ask sometimes because sometimes I think that you know I can just go with what I think I should do for this step and then um but then sometimes it turns out it's wrong and then like I don't sometimes like I don't even know what I should be asking my mentor Ooh, yeah so it's mm. like it's like a whole thing to like adapt to but and even um because of the pandemic it's even harder to communicate and like the, have that back and forth between a mentor and I guess student so mm -hmm. It's been a challenge oh my these past few months. It's so when, stressful. When you said you didn't even know what questions you should were supposed to be asking, that's like that I feel that a lot. Yeah. Me too. Oh, okay. Another thing that really like I guess we can talk about our like um uh, academic background later, but also being a biochem major and my mentor is not he's like a physics um mm. background, like PhD. So he always expects me to know like stuff about chemistry which I learned nothing in college about chemistry <laughs> I don't know why but like he's always asking me like whether these two molecules will have or will be reactive or like he'll be like I don't know if you just ask me some like random chemistry questions and I'll never have the answer <laughs> and mm. Google doesn't even have the answer most of the times <laughs> Sally, when you were um, applying to this position, I assume that you saw like the position um, description or whatever. Like, did mm -hmm. you go into it feeling like, oh, this is kind of a reach for me? Or did you think that like, okay, like this is doable, like, like I'll be able to, to do a lot, pick up on stuff. And then when you got into it, you realized that either there's a mentor or like whatever is happening. Yeah. Like, well, did you go into it with that mindset? Okay, so from the description, that my mentor sent me when he was reaching out to me. Um, honestly, I like I heard of the idea of this like expansion microscopy because one of my friends also does this, but she's in neuroscience, so it's like a little bit different from what we're doing because we're trying to do it to do it in tumors. Anyways, um, like I vaguely heard of the idea, but mm. I wasn't sure if I was interested in it. But I kind of just accepted the job because I'm mean, like, like Liz, it was the first job that I yeah. got an offer for, and I was like, I don't want to miss out on this opportunity in case I'm unemployed for a whole year, and then I have to be <laughs> like, I don't know, I don't know. I just like wanted a job, mm -hmm. and it was kind of like getting late in our senior year too, and everyone already had something secured, so I was yeah. like, first job I got, mm. um, and. When I went to the tour, like the, I guess like a visit um, to the lab during spring break, um, this was before I accepted the offer. I had a tour of the lab and then my mentor kind of explained what they did. Okay, that was when it began. Like I was like, oh my gosh, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> like, I remember when I was talking to my mentor and he likes to talk a lot. So we ended up talking, He well, he ended up talking to me for uh. like several hours. It was just a visit. Wow. And he wow. talked. I was there for, I think, five hours. Dang, not just talking to him, know. but mostly talking to him. Yeah. So that kind of, it kind of intimidated me, but I also just wanted the job. So I went yeah. With it. 
I have to say, like, I, I feel like I could give really good advice to other people about imposter syndrome, but I myself cannot take that advice. Like, I want to tell you, like, and comfort you that you were hired for a reason. Like, they saw mm-hmm. your application. They knew who they were hiring. So, obviously, they thought you were competent enough to do this job. Mm-hmm. So, you shouldn't doubt yourself for that. But then, like, why can't I accept that? Because <laughs> I feel like if when I tell myself that, I have a lot of, like, but, but, buts. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What about, Honestly, I don't um, know why they hired me. I think it was because <laughs> of my recommendation letters, but not because of my experience, because I don't have much experience with this. I mean, there's like a way to gain experience, though. Yeah, so you have to start somewhere. Yeah, gotta yeah. start from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, enough about me. Linda, we what are. about you? I guess we're both working in like the nonprofit area. So what are your thoughts on that? Because I have thoughts. <laughs> Mm, like <laughs> imposter syndrome regarding working in a nonprofit, or, or just in general if you feel imposter syndrome in your position at all mm, kind of because sometimes i'm like i'm too good for this but then for like other descriptions <gasps> okay. i'm like i don't know what to do <laughs> <laughs> i think it's because like a person on our team left so i was given more responsibility and that kind of like got to my head a bit that i was given like so much power in such a short amount of time that i'm, I'm like Mm-hmm. okay like I got this and whatever and before I was like kind of the lowest person on like the hierarchy because I was the youngest and like the most recently joined but then we got like, another person who was a temp who I have to kind of like help a little bit and mm. I'm like okay this kind of doesn't feel like I'm the lowest person anymore because in the nonprofit, I think hierarchy is like super regulated like you have a boss and then you have your boss's boss and then there's like an org chart that they show you and you mm-hmm. get onboarded so you know like exactly who's above you or like a pyramid stuff like that yeah yeah, yeah kind of like a pyramid um and I think the imposter bit was I do like comp sci stuff like, I was telling Ming on Friday I was like I made an html deliverable and I was like Ming my soul is leaving my body because I was doing so much work just to get this little thing done. I'm like, if they only hired a CS major, they could probably have this done like, like in two seconds. But here I am like with a public health degree, kind of knowing nothing about admin and like Salesforce. And I'm like on the Salesforce oh forum Salesforce. trying to figure yeah. out what's happening. Cause I don't want to ask other people. So I'm just like yeah. going through Google. And I feel like I like kind of get into a hole sometimes. Cause I don't want to ask for help in case I like out myself as an imposter imposter so I just like try to do everything myself um but yeah that's kind of been my experience I don't know if that's like specific to nonprofits though because I also took the first job I I got offered and I was like this job is like ethically acceptable because <laughs> it's working with babies and toddlers like it's a very pure labor environment so mm. yeah that's what I got what about you, Ming? I feel like maybe we all just need to have someone younger than us join the team. Because that seems like it worked for you. Like it gave you a little yeah. boost. Because like you, Linda, we also got onboarded with an org chart that like showed everyone's positions. And I'm not like alone at the bottom. But based on my own like personal experience in the working world, I have none. So even compared to the person who's technically on the same like level as me, she's she was in the Peace Corps. She worked like for five years and like she has all this experience and she's engaged. And I think, I don't know, it's just like that, like the the personal and the a professional, like feeling not inferior, but feeling like younger in that situation. I just, I feel like I feel imposter syndrome basically every day I'm at work because I didn't major in marketing on like Liz. Maybe I should have majored in the marketing. Um, I have no don't idea worry. what I'm doing. I don't know anything like. about Salesforce. <laughs> it's like um and a thing that my boss likes to do that I think maybe contributes to it and maybe I should talk to her about this but like also she's super nice so I don't want to be confrontational but one of her things is that she likes to encourage people before presentations or before you know sending out a big email she's always like you are the expert like we hired you to be the expert on social media or on whatever like they want to hear from you And I feel like to maybe some other people that would be like super encouraging and be like, yes, I am the expert. But like to me, I'm just like, no, I'm not. Who's the expert? (laughs) I'm not an expert. That like heightens my feeling of fraud that she thinks 
I'm an expert, but like I literally just Google how to like set up this stuff, especially because I think that also plays into it. Like the t- the the role I'm in as social media, I feel like I'm always. I don't know. I'm always like bashing myself because I'm like, oh, it's just social media. So like they could hire anyone and obviously they hired me. So they hired anyone. And it's just, I'm like, I shouldn't be struggling with this because it's just social media. But yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like a lot of that feeling where you went to college for a certain thing. And even in Sally's case, like it sounds like you went to college for like what you're trying to do, but you still don't feel prepared And then when you get into your job, you're just comparing yourself. Like it's like even worse than in in college because now like you have that hierarchy and ranking so you can easily see who you compare yourself to. It's just a lot of kind of that stress of like not feeling like you belong, but not knowing what else you could do. So you're like Mm -hmm. stuck here. I feel like that contributes. Yeah, I think it's also harder in the work environment because you have a boss who has expectations of you. Whereas when you were studying in college, like you're, you, I mean, you have parents that might have expectations of you, but they don't know how everyone else is doing. So like you yeah. know yourself best and you know your position best and you're the one who's like pushing yourself to do better. And there's no one that's like, I guess, disappointed at you, but except for yourself when you don't do as you like if you don't do as well as you intended to Mm, yeah that's true also you're like a singular person like for me I'm the only program associate at my company but if you're a student you're like there's hundreds others Mm -hmm. of you in your same major in your same class so it's like you don't have specific obligations that only you can fulfill for your boss and I don't know if many of this makes you feel better but social media is like what everyone wants to get into it's like a billion dollar industry or whatever so it's not like anyone could do it you know that's why people have marketing departments and they have so much money social media is not as easy as emily in paris (laughs) wants everyone to believe i don't even think her posts are that interesting (laughs) i don't know if you guys watched that show I don't know. I just all I remember is that remember that time Linda and I had oh. to make a post on our Instagram for Ming's birthday, and we were like racking our brains just for a caption. For what to say <laughs> for her birthday? And you're like, post. How does Ming do this every week? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it is true. Like logically, when you look at it, for all of our situations, like we shouldn't be feeling these feelings because, like I said before, we were hired for a reason, and you know our bosses thought that we could contribute and we've been doing well so far like we haven't been fired so far so like we must not be that bad but it's like your it's like your inner voice I think um maybe this just comes out in more like anxious people I don't know but are we all anxious people I'm anxious anxious type (laughs) also the thing is like I'm above this job Okay, the thing is, like, positive reinforcement just makes things worse in terms mm. of imposter syndrome, though. Like, you mean, when there's, like, you're the expert that's supposed to make yeah. you feel confident, but it's, like, higher expectations are making them yeah. so known, and it doesn't even help. So, like, okay. yeah. but then I don't want negative, um, like, feedback either, because you're not like, an expert. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. taking notes as you guys were sharing yours, and I heard oh, a lot of no. things that I relate to. I didn't want to miss any talking points you know Mm -hmm. um but what Linda just said encouragement that feels like expectations I know it comes from a good place but I'm just like I'm the future you think that (laughs) I'm the future (laughs) that makes me nervous um and I think looking at my like messy notes here I feel like a bottom line that a lot of new grads and I'm not that old I guess I'm, I'm only a year out have a hard time adjusting to or figuring out is that it's okay to just be learning um I think our education systems I know a lot of our teachers try really hard they do their best um I appreciate that for sure um but our society our culture just everything that shapes us while we're growing up I feel like it's so tied to results and Mm. and to products and there's a there's a time and place for that you can't you can't like go through a job for like 10 years and be like 
sorry, I messed up guys. I'm still learning. I'm still <laughs> learning. At some point you do need to know what you're doing. But at this point in our careers, I've come to realize that it's okay to just be learning. Um, and that leads me to like another point about expectations. Yes, we were hired for a reason. And I like to think that they don't hire us because we know what Salesforce is. I was a marketing major. I didn't learn what Salesforce <laughs> is. What is Salesforce? Don't Can someone explain? I, I don't even I don't know what it is. Linda, explain, so. explain it. Linda. Okay, so I think Salesforce is the umbrella company for something called a PMDS, which is Program Management D Data System or something. And that's where all the things live under like all the contacts and all the states and all the details about people. And sometimes we joke that it's like the surveillance state because it like tracks Big everyone brother. in yeah. our network. Um, but now I'm like getting into it. I'm like invested in what happens to our PMDS. And what? I'm part of like the super user like thing where they push things through in the sandbox environment. I don't know if Ming, if Stefan ever talks to you about the sandbox environment, but it's kind of cool how they can just make any functionality happen. And you can just see it and it just like pops up. So that's Salesforce. <laughs> Thanks for the crash course. Um, yeah, so while you guys were talking, I was actually taking notes because um, I didn't want to miss anything that I wanted to expand upon, I guess. Um, but a lot of what you said, I, I really relate to. Those are feelings that sound familiar. And so what Linda just said about encouragements that feel like expectations. One of my favorite coworkers, um, sometimes he would say to me stuff like, yeah, like, cause, so he's like one of the only people I felt comfortable asking for help. So I'd always be like, thank you so much for answering my question. He goes, yeah, no problem. Like you're, you're the future. You're the future. And I'm just like, <laughs> me, <laughs> the future. Um, and it, it makes, yeah, it makes me feel a little bit stressed. I'm like, do, does that imply that I'm going to stay in this career field yeah. that you think I can do it? There's just so many questions that come up with that. Um, so I, I totally related to that one too. Um, which also brings me to what Ming was saying about like, we were all hired for a reason. Um, and I think I get why we all feel like, why did they hire me? Like, I don't know what Salesforce is or, um, I didn't know what a SharePoint was before. It's hmm. literally just like an internal website. And most people like, I thought I, I knew I had to know how to build one. All I have to do is know how to access it. That's easy. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, so one lesson that I've learned is that, or at least that I tell myself, and I think it's, I think it's a healthy mindset to take. Um, coming right out of college at least, I don't think anyone hires us because they think we know how to do it. Um, they know that we just came from college. Um, and so what I think is that they're hiring you just to be um, generally smart, know how to think critically, know how to learn. Um, actually, one of my other coworkers told me that after <laughs> We were having a phone conversation about some big thing that I couldn't figure out. And I think he could tell I was about to cry. Oh, it was so nice. <laughs> it was so nice of him to be like, let's talk about feeling overwhelmed. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I missed nice. him. Um, but yeah, so it's okay for us to just be learning, which was the big thing I wanted to say that I feel like underlies a lot of our insecurities here. Um, and what I'm about to say could be a totally separate conversation. We could talk about it forever. But I think especially in America, our society, just the way that kids are brought up, we're really tied to production and results. Um, mm -hmm. And those are important. Like, like Sally was saying, you eventually have to produce results in your lab. Um, but I think it's really unrealistic to ask a new college grad to know everything and execute the process perfectly, never mess it up, um, great end result, know everything right off the bat. Um, it's okay for you to just be learning. And I think a lot of us get confused because to us, learning is something you do in school. And when you graduate school, that means it's time for you to stop learning and start doing. 
but you can be doing both at the same time. Um, and that was something it took me a really long time to get because at my regular office, um, I think that the expectations placed upon me were unrealistic, but not having another job before this, I didn't realize it was unrealistic. Um, mm. So all these, all these things that my colleagues knew from having worked in this industry like five, 10 years or, or have, having been in the military for like almost 20 years, there's a lot of knowledge that you take for granted. And, and I expect that all of us at some point in our careers, we're gonna forget that like, oh yeah, I forgot you interns wouldn't know that right away. Like, oh, of course, here's how you do it. Um, but at my organization, they don't have a lot of young people. I'm one of the youngest and in my position of intern, they haven't had many at this particular office. So I, mm. I've come to realize that a lot of the people that I work with, great people, very smart, they aren't necessarily accustomed to teaching someone who, who doesn't even have the foundations. Um, so a lot of stuff I'd be like, can you explain that to me? Can you explain it to me again? And then I don't understand and I'm afraid to ask again because like you already explained it to me twice. Mm -hmm. um, so those are like two points. Um, it's okay to just be learning and our bosses and managers are human too. Um, the expectations they set, they might be unrealistic. And, and I think that's something for us to realize like, what are we actually capable of? What's possible? Um, but yeah. That's okay. like all the things that you guys talked about. <laughs> if, um, I was a what? Oh, ahead, I was Linda. gonna say that. Wait, Linda or Liz? go ahead, go ahead. Finish your thought, Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was just gonna say that I think what I was talking about touched on knowledge-based imposter syndrome. And I think for me this would be really specific. And we can talk about it later because Linda has something to say. But I think what I'm experiencing more strongly in this rotation that I'm at now is like cultural imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, but Linda, go ahead. What were you going to say? What was I going to say? It wasn't that important. But I think Liz brings up a good point that there's different types of imposter syndrome. Like I know for me, one, time, one type is like you want to be naturally good at something. So when you have to put in effort that you feel like you're not supposed to be there. And mm -hmm. that's like a specific type. There's also some other type, like more cultural, like Liz was describing. Oh, Ming, I was going to ask you if you remember that TikTok I sent you where it's like this guy. And then he's like, me after my manager spends 15 minutes explaining why <laughs> they're not mad at me. And then they're like, pushes in a tear. And then he's like, want to see my renegade? And then he's like doing it. I feel like that's exactly how my relationship is with my marriage is like okay you're not mad at me time to like restore yeah. to homeostasis yeah i have a few well, okay so if you guys aren't <laughs> watching our youtube video listening to this but you're just listening to this on the podcast i was like nodding to what liz had to say the entire time because she makes really excellent points like i feel like we go to school and we're especially in university like the whole reason we're there is to get a job and like mm -hmm. You're, you're there in a specific major to get a specific job. And so you feel like when you graduate, you're supposed to get that specific job. And if you don't, like, you feel like your, your learning is over. Like, you have to quickly learn whatever you can in those four years of undergrad. And then, you know, boom, you're, like, in the working world and you should be able to apply all that knowledge, especially after you spend, like, thousands of dollars, whatever. Like, that's how college makes you feel. It makes you feel like you're if you don't learn it then, then you're like never going to learn it. But Liz makes a good point that you're still learning, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what Linda, you said about uh, there being like different types of imposter syndrome. I think that's true too. Like, like that you want to be inherently like good at it already. And maybe it's just our personality types again, but I really do think it's like kind of people pleaser too. Like we have high. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Like what like, you said about but when I don't feel useful, if I'm not doing something, I'm like, is there something I can do? Are you sure mm -hmm. there's nothing I can do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Linda, you're talking about like that TikTok where you need to be assured from your boss that they still like you. Like, <laughs> I feel like, I don't know if that's normal. Maybe other people are okay to just be like regular. Yeah, Liz. 
<laughs> Sorry, I raised my hand. Um, no, I was, I'll try to make it short because I don't want to use all the time. But I feel like a lot of these lessons that I've just like dropped, I didn't really have them like solidified in my own mind until I started this rotation. Um, again, I like all of my coworkers at both offices, but leadership makes a huge difference. Um, and some people are not, they're just not used to like having to teach someone. Um, but at my new office, I sit around here doing a lot of learning. And for the first three weeks, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing anything, but they don't seem upset about it. I keep asking them for stuff to do and they go, just listen into this meeting. And so I finally figured out like, it, they, they want me to just be learning. They're okay with that. Um, and then the other thing was that they keep praising me. <laughs> <laughs> and when when they first started doing it I was like ah oh, they're just saying that because I haven't really done anything um but they've been saying it a lot this week because we've been busy and I I have been able to do a lot um but yeah I, I think it's we're just so used to having to to produce something and like give something to someone else if but you could we could be doing a good job just by learning well um we're trying mm -hmm. our best and I, I know there's always going to be someone like saying like, oh, you don't want to baby them. Um, well, something, something participation trophies. No, <laughs> no, it's not like that. Yeah. Supportive leadership is actually so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, Sally, if you have any thoughts on that. Because I, I feel like do. your mentor could. Leave. Yeah. Well, okay. So the reason why I guess I've been having... Well, like some part of the reason why I've been having this problem, like communicating with him, I guess, and like also his expectations on me and stuff is because I guess he's also learning because I'm only the second um, person in this postback position that he's mentored. So the person before me was his first and she was also like an experiment of sorts, <laughs> like like the of his teaching. And then um, I guess being the second one, I'm still sort of like an experiment on for him to, like for teaching so he doesn't have like relatively that much experience ex experience on um, teaching a student and there is like a gap because he has many years of experience in this field and then I'm like fresh out of college never done this work before so like sometimes he just assumes that I knows that I know things that like, I shouldn't know because I have no way of knowing before, but he does, like, I mean, he does admit that he has these ex expectations, unrealistic expectations a lot of times, and he does pull himself yeah. back, but also, like, unsub unsubconsciously or subconsciously, he, he just puts these expectations out, so he does, like, apologize sometimes for that, but I think, um, like just being in a position of power, it doesn't mean that like your boss knows everything. They're they yeah, might still be that's learning. A really good point. Yeah. They're learning different things because mm -hmm. they're in a different position than we are. Yeah. And they're also learning how to adapt to you because everyone has like a different working style and mm -hmm. you might be the first kind of person that does things this way or I don't know. I feel like what Sally's making Sally's point is really good. Um, connecting to what Liz and Linda have said about culture and how like you have to adapt to working culture as well and I think that can play a p big part in your posture syndrome depending on your work culture and it's not that we're just learning like literal skills but also like how to adapt and work with these people as well. Mm -hmm. mm. So I guess speaking of interpersonal adapting do we want to wrap up by talking about I guess, imposter syndrome in our personal lives or more in relationships or in cultural groups like Ming and Liz have mentioned before? Yeah, I wanted to add this point because I feel like what Liz said at the very beginning of the podcast is so true that when you do hear about imposter syndrome, you think about professional, like in the workplace kind of imposter syndrome. But I was reading an article and it was talking about how some couples feel imposter syndrome, like in a romantic relationship, like you feel like you, you're, you, you're not a good partner. And I feel like that could also apply to friendships and, you know, family, like whatever relationship you're in, you could easily doubt 
And that's probably has a, a bit to do with your own insecurities, but also feeling like that you don't really fulfill what they need out of a partner. So I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but I think I felt it a little bit when I first started dating Stefan because I knew that he had dated plenty of people before me. And this was like my first person, my first partner. And so I was constantly questioning what I was doing, if that's really what he wanted. And I don't know, I just felt like maybe I'm, I wasn't meant to be a, a partner, a romantic partner or someone, as silly as that mm. sounds. Yeah. I think a specific example is that when I'm like so bad at words of affirmation, I'm like, why can't I just give the other person what they want and like what they're asking for? Like, why am I so bad at just saying the right thing? And then that's like, oh, like, I don't know how to be a good girlfriend and things like that. So I feel like imposter syndrome in terms of the role you're supposed to fulfill, because I think in society, in romantic relationships, you're like, ascribing to a specific like role of girlfriend or role of partner that you have to live up to Mm -hmm. I totally agree with what Linda was saying like I struggle so much to show affection like give words of affirmation and I guess um near the end of our relationship I was also like struggling a lot to like put out the time and like show more effort in our relationship when like physically I couldn't like I had no time outside of work and like no mental capacity to like be in a relationship so at that point I was like like am I really just in this relationship to be in a relationship or like I don't know anyways that was like the whole (laughs) like I guess that's how I felt like an imposter because I felt like I was just in the relationship but I wasn't putting forth what was expected of me to be like as being in this role Mm. yeah it's those expectations that always get you whether like in work or in your personal relationships I don't know if they're I guess they're from society but also like they're imposed like I I internalize those expectations I guess too much Mm -hmm. I think Mm. also looking at other couples you have you can like get your like couple goals yeah couple (laughs) goals yeah (laughs) Like, you're supposed to be happy all the time and, like, mm-hmm. um, have all these, like, intense feelings. But usually, you're just, like, domestic plotting. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, Liz, do you have any I'm thoughts? I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you can I, talk about something else, too. I think, at least in romantic relationships, I don't think that I felt imposter syndrome I definitely did compare to other people's relationships and I was like why don't we do that Mm -hmm. um but I think for me it's I don't know if this would be described as imposter syndrome um but after my ex and I broke up prior to that I thought I'd been doing a decent job (laughs) I was like I think I'm pretty caring Blah, blah 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 um But afterwards, I really questioned all those things, not just about myself as a girlfriend, but as a person, I was like, well, if he liked all these things about me before, but now we're broken up, does it mean I'm not all these things anymore? Mm. Am I not a good friend? Am I not a caring person? Um, And I just really, I definitely let one other person's perceptions of me, like, stress me out a lot. and again, there's always, like, take it with a grain of salt. Like, if everybody says you're being a jerk, maybe you're being a jerk. <laughs> but but I think we know ourselves, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. I don't know if there's a conclusion to that thought. Sorry. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Yeah. I, especially, yeah, when you're in that situation of being in the relationship where because of those expectations, you're, like, thinking like you're always in relation to someone obviously that's why it's called a relationship but you're always like how am I how are my interactions like affecting this person and I think at least I can get like really into that and then that kind of reflects back on how I think of myself too I don't know Mm -hmm. okay yeah for me imposter syndrome or like just not fitting in I think I feel it more in groups 
Um, so like out, oh, you mm -hmm. guys can't see me at work. Like I want to relate to everybody so bad, <laughs> but being the youngest, one of the only women, only one who is not, or has never been in the military, literally. Um, sometimes they just talk about stuff and I'm like, all right, I'll just stay over here and keep typing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah they're still nice they're all really nice mm. not to bring it back to like work too much but I also feel this like imposter syndrome with my colleagues and even like peers around the same age as me because I feel like a, a lot of people around me ha are like very passionate about what they're doing or they have like a clear goal mm -hmm. and they're like I want to achieve this like this is why I'm in this position but for me I feel like I don't have that passion I'm just like trying to be employed, make money. <laughs> like, I don't really know, like, I don't really have a, a clear goal in mind of what I want to do. So I feel like in terms of like, um, just like passion for your job, I don't I'm like an imposter. <laughs> mm. I just act like I'm working hard, but for like, um, for my passions. But in reality, I'm just, I'm not even working that hard. <laughs> I just want to get paid. <laughs> I oh, think that's it's okay. okay. <laughs> I think that's okay. I think I yeah. forgot to say it before. Sorry, I'm talking so much. Um, but about how Ming had asked, like being called an intern calls in like imposter syndrome into, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but yes. Um, <laughs> and the thing I forgot to say before was that, especially at my new office, because I physically look so different, mm. even when, even when I feel like I know what I, I'm doing, like, I know my team knows who I am. I know they know what I can do, but everybody else in that office, I know, I'm so aware of what they see. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, they just see like some little Asian girl who, who looks like she's still in college. And that's, that's who they think I am. They don't think I'm capable a lot of people are like, do you work here? Oh, do you work? Are you in college? Did you graduate? Um, and and mm. it's not their fault because I do look a lot younger than them. Um, but looking physically different has definitely made me feel like an imposter because a mm. lot of people look at me like I don't belong there. That was, yeah. that was it for me. Mm -hmm. That makes sense though because it's like yeah, a lot of this is in our mind or whatever. Or like, we just need to overcome our insecurities. But it also is a uh, true that you know, based on our environment or our yeah, our work environment and the people around us, like maybe we're not that like not that out of. I don't know what I'm trying to say. We're not that far out from like the fact that people might think we are like a little young for this. Or you know, people will always question your skill set until they actually mm -hmm. see it. That's why yeah. this past week was so stressful for me because my big project was about like presenting to some VPs who I don't normally work with. And so the whole mm -hmm. time I was thinking like, they're going to be like questioning me, like who's this little girl to be presenting to them? And like, who am I to be talking to the VPs? But like at the end of the day, it's, I had to show my skill and um, I don't know, they were impressed at the end of it, but it was like that thinking of how people perceive me, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that can be for any relationship question so you and I both just referred to ourselves as who's this little Asian girl who's this little girl <laughs> <laughs> what what does that say about how we perceive ourselves oh oh yeah <laughs> you guys <are> there <laughs> I think because I catch myself thinking that a lot and then I go what if they actually don't really care I mean that's true yeah Maybe. It's so it's so hard though it because could be both. it could be yeah both. I think it is both I think as Asian American women we we've grown up like seeing those stereotypes in media or just in the way people have talked to us I've been talked to in a demeaning manner and I don't think it was because of like my age I think it's because of what I looked like so I think that there is that truth to it and that's why we're so sensitive about it or why maybe I think about that a lot more consciously than like a white younger male would mm. also maybe mm. because there were surroundings like I don't know about you guys but the lab that I work in I'm the only Asian person and one of the few like all the lower I guess 
lower ranked people, <laughs> including me, are women, like all the higher above people or um, ma- white males. Mm-hmm. So that also plays into like the hierarchy. Yeah. yeah. That's the same in my org too. Like the people who are on like my level or close to it are women of color. We're like mostly mm-hmm. women, but it's mostly like white women and specifically white men, white women with brown hair who are moms like it's a very specific (laughs) majority demographic going on and you see them like the massive faces across the screen you're like literally no one looks like me on Mm. on the camera and I feel like it's sometimes less apparent because you don't see each other like in your body like most of the time but you still you're like still aware of how you look and how other people look Mm -hmm. yeah so I feel like that's why our default I guess to go back to what you were saying Liz is like little Asian girl is because that's I guess at the deep root of it that's how I think people perceive me if they don't know me which is sad but yeah that's where you go back when you're super insecure about yourself you like think the like the the deep (laughs) like you try to get to the like the darkest not the darkest but the like the rudest thing I think or at least that's my brain yes. like the it like it, it goes the to inside like, of the onion <laughs> yeah <laughs> the core the core of like how mm. white America might perceive me yeah that's true I, I mean, mean you had to tell yourself Ming I am a grown woman not a little girl because sometimes I'm like I'm so young but I think that's also part of the problem just like being young in comparison yeah and yeah. the fact is that we are young um if we are young there is a lot we don't know um and I feel like post-grad is just this weird balance of like learning how to act like an adult because you are one but also learning how to like accept that you're still learning yeah mm-hmm. it's a balance 